Am I the asshole for not wanting a baby girl so that my mother-in-law wouldn't have the chance to name her? I'm pregnant and I'm about to give birth to our first baby together and my mother-in-law wants to name the baby after her daughter that passed away. My mother-in-law wanted us to get pregnant right after we got married so that her daughter would be reborn. My husband and I dated for eight years and then we finally decided to get married and everyone was super happy about this. Our wedding planning was in progress, but due to an unfortunate accident, my sister-in-law passed away right before our wedding. We did end up postponing our wedding about a year to just give everyone time to grieve. After the wedding, everyone on my husband's side of the family, all of the relatives, wanted us to get pregnant immediately and they really wanted it to be a daughter. To be honest, there was a lot of pressure on us. Gradually, after a year of being married, we were pregnant and we were extremely happy about this. Am I the asshole for not wanting a baby girl so that my mother-in-law wouldn't have the chance to name her? Gradually, after a year of being married, we were pregnant and we were extremely happy about this. I truly I really wish that it will be a baby boy and not a baby girl because of my mother-in-law. I honestly feel like I would be depressed if it was a baby girl because I know that my mother-in-law would just portray my daughter as her own daughter being reborn. As a note, I did not really know my sister-in-law that much because my husband and I at the time were in a long distance relationship. And unfortunately, my sister-in-law passed away before I could even meet and get to know her. My husband is very supportive. Me and him already talked to my mother-in-law about not wanting to name our daughter after her late daughter. And it just seems like my mother-in-law is just not respecting our boundaries. So am I the asshole for not wanting a baby girl so that my mother-in-law wouldn't have the chance to name her? Am I in the wrong for telling my mum she's going straight into a nursing home whilst my dad is gonna live a life of luxury? Story time. So. I have never really had a very good relationship with my mum. I'll call her Sandra. She's a very vain, superficial and very materialistic woman. That's just not my vibe. In all honesty, I do not see what my dad sees in her at all. I can tell you the exact moment as to when I stopped caring about my mum. So when I was 13, I was riding my bike and I got into an awful accident. I basically got hit by a car. One of the worst injuries I got was on my face. I had a really, really bad scar. It would take cosmetic surgery to fix and rectify. And as soon as I recovered from like the physical or the physical injuries my mum really started to push me to have this surgery I had not so great of a time in hospital and I was just far too anxious to go back but fortunately my dad put his foot down and was like when she's ready to have the surgery she can have the surgery but she's not doing it till she's ready Lay dad my dad reminded me every day that i was still beautiful later in life i would find out that my mom had told my brothers to make me feel ugly for my scar so that i could get the surgery quicker and if i ever had a hard time at school because of it and kids were making fun of me for how i looked my mom would be like well you know how to fix it because of the type of job that my dad had he wasn't seeing much of this go on he could never really shield me from my mum's opinions but when he finally found out what had been going on he lost his shit and he even threatened to divorce my mum slay number two for dad eventually i caved and i ended up getting the surgery during my recovery time my mum got invited to her best friend's wedding the whole family was invited but she only took my brothers because she still believed i was too ugly whilst i still was recovering from the surgery she didn't believe that I'd be pretty enough to be involved in the wedding pictures. And from that day, I literally hated my mom. Didn't want her involved in any big moments in my life. So me and my husband just bought our first house and like in the garden, it's like a little garage type thing, which has a bedroom, a bathroom, a little living room and a kitchenette. And this is where I intend for my dad to be able to live one day. And when my mom saw the house, she made every single complaint she could. She said that she was gonna require one of the bedrooms in our house. And I looked at her and I was like, why do you, why, why do you think that? Like, why do you even think you're going to have like a little sleepover for one night, let alone like stay with me? She was like, what do you mean? I said, why do you think I'd have you in my house and I wouldn't find the cheapest care home I could find and put you in there? Mother was absolutely shocked. And at that moment, I got to tell her all of the crappy stuff. So fired up today. At that moment, I finally told her how much of a crappy parent she was. And unless her beloved sons are going to pamper her in her old age, she will be left on the streets in an adult diaper. Now my brothers are calling me daily, telling me how much of an insensitive asshole I am. Inconsiderate assholes. They say I should forgive her past mistakes. 
but personally i'm not really too sure what i've done wrong here but yeah please do let me know what you think about all of this in the comments update for am i the asshole for telling my husband's affair baby's family to either come and get the kid or i'm calling cps i'm no longer divorcing roger there were complications from his heart attack and he passed away i'm conflicted he was the love of my life but also a cheating piece of trash to the best of my knowledge the mother will not be returning from europe the child is currently with her parents they asked me what I wanted to do. Why are they asking you what you want to do with a baby that has nothing to do with you? This is their child's child, their grandchild. They should be asking themselves, what are we going to do? The family asked me what I wanted to do. I recommended adoption. Not that I adopt a child, but that they put the child up for adoption. They didn't like that suggestion. Neither did my children. Well, then they can keep the baby. I don't understand what the problem is. I don't understand what the problem is. The one person who has no biological relation, no type of relationship or ties to this child is the one person that wants nothing to do with this child. But that's the one person everybody wants to take care of this child. That is fucking ridiculous. If you guys feel so strongly about the baby, then one of y'all need to step up and adopt the child. They said I'm being cold and cruel. I suggested that since the child was related to them and not to me, that they step up. Neither has accepted that suggestion either. I fucking bet they didn't. I fucking bet. I was the sole beneficiary of Roger's estate. So I imagine lawyers will be involved in getting the child some sort of support. I will pay whatever is ordered by the court out of the estate. I will not pay one cent out of my own money. That's all I have to say on this matter. Girl, this is fucking insane. The fact that you are having to fight everybody because you do not want to care for a child that's not yours. That is insane. You had nothing to do with this child. It is not your fault that your children's father is a lying, cheating piece of shit. It is not your fault that these people's daughter cheated with the married man and then decided to leave when she couldn't handle being a mom. That's not none of your fault. None of that has anything to do with you. You have no type of responsibility to this child. None whatsoever. Now, I'm sorry that your husband has passed away. Like I know, Even though he's a lying, cheating piece of shit, clearly you still had feelings for him and you're grieving. So I am sorry that your husband passed away. I am. But girl... Go on vacation. I need you to just go ahead and just book you a vacation somewhere for a couple weeks. Just just go and sit by the beach or get a spa. And I want you to drink until you can't feel your toes. Because, mama, you need it. You need it. This shit is not okay. And you do not deserve to have to go through this. Am I the asshole for refusing to attend a wedding because my husband's not welcome there? My friend is getting married in August and she invited me and my husband already in October when she got engaged and I was asked to be the maid of honor. She didn't have the date set for the wedding immediately, but now she does and all of a sudden she's telling me that she thinks my husband shouldn't come. I asked her why and she didn't want to tell me at first but I just kept asking her to tell me and she finally told me that it's because he's shorter than me and it would look weird in pictures. My husband's about five foot four and I'm five five and I don't think the difference is really anything crazy so I offered to not wear heels but she said I have to wear heels because I'm the maid of honor and the bridesmaids will also be wearing heels. So I told her that if my husband's not invited because of his height of all things, then I'm not coming to her wedding. And she said that the day is about her and it's not about me and my husband, so I should respect her wishes about her big day. She said that she's really counting on me as her maid of honor and that I can't do this to her. Am I the asshole for refusing to attend a wedding because my husband's not welcome there? I told her that she's being really shallow and it's either me and my husband or it's neither of us. I did talk to my husband about it and he said that he thinks that I'm not the asshole and that he actually thinks it would be bad if I would have agreed with my friend, which I definitely agree. However, he of course is going to take my side because he really doesn't like her that much. Like He's really not that big of a fan of her, but but she doesn't even know that, so that couldn't even play the role in why he's not invited in the first place.
That's why I wanted to ask here if I'm the asshole because I'm not really sure if his opinion is exactly objective. I asked my other friend and she said she thinks that I am the asshole because it's just one day and it is about the bride so I shouldn't make drama out of it. I don't know, I'm really conflicted. Maybe I am the asshole because I'm really just focusing on being there with my husband and not focusing on what the bride wants. I would love to hear outside opinions on this that are non-biased and if you guys think that I'm in the right or if I am the asshole. Story time, and this is Katie's story. When Katie was 16, she used to run track and cross country, so she's gone a lot of runs. Initially, Katie used to run on roads, but she got catcalled a lot while running on roads. So eventually, she found this trail by her high school that she could run on. The trail passed next to a park, then it passed next to a field where a lot of teams would practice, and eventually it would turn and pass next to her high school. So it seemed like a pretty safe trail to run on. There was the park, there was the field where people were practicing, there was her high school. There were people who would actually walk on the trail, like there were people around. Safe trail, right? Hmm, no. So this one day in summer, Katie is running on the trail at about 9 p.m. And if you're wondering why she was running at 9 p.m., it was summer. It was hot. It was still light outside since it was summer. It felt safe to run at that time. It should have been safe. So she's running on the trail. She passes the park. She passes the field. And right before she gets to her high school, the trail kind of turns and it's this bend that's kind of hidden away from the park. So Katie is in that section. She's running and she passes this guy who was in that bend. And right after she passes him, the guy starts running after her. And then he starts hissing at her like a snake. So Katie is running. The guy is right here, like a foot away from her, hissing at her. And she keeps running. And then he goes, are you scared of me? Are you scared of me? So Katie is obviously scared of him. And she starts booking it to get to the end of the trail and get to a major road. So she's running. The guy is running after her, saying these things, hissing at her. And eventually she makes it to the end of the trail and she turns around and she sees the guy at the top of the trail or like, you know, a few meters behind, just standing there staring at her. Katie runs home. I think this is a really important story to share just because it shows how often and how regularly women are harassed when doing normal day-to-day -day things. Katie was just on a run. There were people around. This shouldn't have happened. And someone said that in society, we are currently teaching girls and women to shrink their lives by being safe. So for example, some of you are gonna say, well, she shouldn't have been running at 9 p.m. Why not? It was light outside. It was hot. There were people around. It should have been fine for her to run. We can't keep shrinking these girls and these women's lives to be safe. Instead, we have to do more to educate boys and educate men to respect women and for them to also challenge their male friends who harass women. So if you have a friend who harasses a woman, whether you're a guy, a girl, non-binary, it doesn't matter. Please challenge them or educate them so that we can stop this and so that women can go and do normal day-to-day -day things without being harassed. So that a 16-year-old girl can go on a run without being chased by a guy and be hissed at and be asked if she's scared. I moved out and took everything. It became apparent to me that last week my roommates were trying to drive me out of the house to get one of their boyfriends on my lease. When I told them I wanted to stay, they started staging incident and messes around the house so they could yell at me for them. It all came to a head when they called a meeting with me two days ago. One of them had to hold the other back as she screamed at me that she hated me and I was not welcome in the building. They proceeded to tell me that I contributed nothing to the house and wasted their space and that they had all gotten with the landlady and convinced her not to renew my lease in June. I told them I talked to the landlady and when they said that they were the heads of the house, I laughed and went on with my day. I spoke to the landlady and they acknowledged that they were out of hand and that she had given them the power to not renew my lease. She said that I could move out whenever and not pay for a single day that I wasn't there. So yesterday, when my roommates both left to visit their family, I immediately called everyone I knew and vacated the house of everything I own. I took the curtains, the rugs, all the cat toys, and even the cat tower that I had made with my mom. I took all of their things off of my shelves and other furniture and stacked them in the middle of a now nearly empty living room. I snapped pictures of everything and handed my keys to the landlady and immediately fucked off. They won't be back to the house until tomorrow and I've blocked them on everything, but I'm sure their faces will be priceless when they come home to a half empty house. So much for me not contributing anything. This story comes from a follower and she said she'd like to be called Desiree. So last year Desiree was starting college and she lived in a dorm room. She went to school for communications and she liked everything about it, including a new friend she made. One of the new friends she created was a guy and his name was Jalen and she was really starting to like him. 
They met in math class, and from there, they became friends. Jalen was low-key hinting that he liked her also. He did nice things for her, like help her with schoolwork, buy her lunch, and was just an all-around good person to vent to. A couple days before winter break, Cassidy was finally ready to tell Jalen how she felt about him. So that day, they had plans to go out as usual. They ended up going to the mall, got food, and for the first time, they went to Cassidy's dorm room. They turned on a movie. They both fell asleep in the middle of the movie. A couple minutes later, Cassidy woke up and her leg was wet. When she stood up, come to find it, Jalen peed in her bed. Okay, so story time. So basically one time in fifth grade, my dad took me to get breakfast from Dunkin' Donuts. We went there before school like always. And as we were there, this strange man outside was staring at me and like making faces. Super creepy. We didn't know him or anything, so we walked inside and I was kind of freaked out. I told my dad that I was creeped out by him and he told me that nothing bad was going to happen. Or so he thought. So we got our food, and we ate it, everything was fine, you know, chill. After we were done, we got up to leave. The man was gone by now, so I felt better and... But then on the way to my school, I saw him walking on the sidewalk. Like, I figured he was going to his house or, like, somewhere else. When we got to my school, no one was outside. It was kind of weird. We went to open the door because my dad was a part of the PTA, so he came in with me. The door, for some reason, was locked. My music teacher out of nowhere ran out and brought us inside quickly. She told us that our whole school was on code red. Uh, scary. And that a man was in our school, so we went inside and I went and hid in the music room. Like for part two. Okay, so part two. So I went and hid in the music room. Dad was in the PTA room, which was close by. Literally started crying because I was so scared and they weren't telling us anything because we were too young. I guess they didn't want to scare us. That didn't work. Once the code red was over, about 30 minutes later, we went to class. I went to go find my dad and make sure he was okay and see if he knew anything. And he didn't. When I got in my classroom, we were all talking about it. And my teacher said that the man just walked in and told them he was looking for one of his teachers from like 15 years back. Huh? They gave us a description of the man, and I realized it was the same man from Dunkin' Donuts. He just walked in my school. I was freaked out because I saw him at Dunkin' Donuts before school started, and I hoped I never saw him again. But a few weeks later, I saw him again multiple times at the same Dunkin' Donuts. He literally just stared at me all the time. So yeah, that's my little story. So I literally thought people were joking when they were talking about stepsisters getting with their stepbrothers. Turns out it's not a joke and I just found out that my boyfriend cheated on me with his stepsister. When I was a freshman in high school, I got into a lot of trouble and ended up getting my phone taken away for six months and had no social media for a year. My parents literally didn't allow me to have Snapchat until the summer before my senior year. But I was allowed to have an Instagram, so the moment that I was allowed to have my socials back, I made an update on my story. And within a few hours, a boy that I had been talking to before I got my phone taken away swiped up. We started messaging, talking again, hitting it off all over again. Again. And even though he lived about two and a half hours away, within a week we started dating. I actually had a few other friends that were dating guys in the same town, so I was like, hmm, if they can, so can I. After dating him for a few months, I decided to invite him over to my dad so that they could meet. Both my dad and him hit it right off the bat. Chef's kiss. Also, we can call this guy Darren. I noticed that he was super weird with his phone and he would put it in his pocket anytime I was near. I asked him what that was about and he was like, well, I just don't want to be on my phone. It seems rude. It seemed like a logical response, so I brushed it off. But the next day, a girl messaged me saying that she was dating Darren. So my boyfriend ended up cheating on me with his stepsister and also other girls as well. So once this first girl reached out to me and said that she had been dating Darren, I blew up in his face. She explained to me that they had been dating for a few weeks, so I ended up breaking up with him. But then he was blowing up my phone and threatening to unalive himself, so I got extremely worried. And I ended up just giving in to getting back together with him. And once I got back together with him, things were pretty much a smooth ride for six months. It didn't seem like he was talking to any other girls, and he would come to my mom's house on one weekend and then my dad's house on the other weekend. So we were seeing each other every weekend. And it was so nice until I got a message from a different girl who also claimed that they had been dating. So again, I blew up in his face and I broke up with him. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And once again, the manipulator in him made a reappearance and he blew up my phone just crying, saying that he was going to end his life, and again, getting me to fall for his stupid tricks. This time, I decided to go about it a different way and get all the social media passwords. I would log in and check periodically, but if you guys remember, I did not have a Snapchat. So the day that my parents allowed me to have one, I went ahead and logged into his. Story time about my boyfriend cheating on me with his stepsister and other women. So once I was allowed to have Snapchat and logged into his account, I saw him messaging multiple other girls, including his stepsister. And when I tell you guys I scrolled up on these messages and found out that he had been sleeping with her too, this had been going on for two and a half years before he finally called things off with me and broke up with me. We met up to exchange things and I gave him all of his stuff back, but he didn't give me any of my stuff back because he forgot. And he tried to give me his own stuff back, saying that we were on a break and would get back together. 
because I called things off with him, he ended up throwing all of my stuff, like my clothes, jewelry, Beats headphones, in a fire pit and burned them as if he was the victim. Like, what did I do to you? You were the one sleeping with your stepsister our entire relationship. After about three months, he showed up with a new girlfriend on his Instagram. And she ended up messaging me asking why he still had pictures of me all over his room and why my necklace with my name on it was hanging in his truck. Yesterday at the nail salon, I voiced my opinion. I spoke up. I used the voice that God gave me. And it is something I will never do again. And here's why. First of all, my nail lady is eight months pregnant. So I can't, like, I feel like a bitch saying anything to her. I feel like a bitch for her doing my nails. Like, I just want to get there, do my nails myself, like, in front of her and, like, tip her 50%. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's how I feel at this point. Because, like, why are, like, no. This is wrong, right? So she did my nails. I got a French manicure and it's dip. So she, like, put this little pink behind it so my nails didn't look, like, weird. And she's done this before, but in the past has been a little bit more like nude and neutral and this is like pink pink so she saw me looking down at them and she was like oh does it look okay and so she asked right so she asked i wasn't just like oh my god i first of all i would never i would literally never i could i genuinely okay anyways i was like oh it's just a little bit more pink i feel like than it usually is well it's too late okay that's no it's totally fine actually this is growing on me i actually love it this is the best manicure you've ever done this is amazing i actually wanted it pink i actually can you do more pink is that possible at this way i love it so much story time and this is Ari's story. Ari worked at a gas station in a small town and she knew most of the customers that came in because it was a small town. There was this one guy who was a regular who was in his mid-sixties who always came in to get a coffee in the morning and a breakfast sandwich and he always made small talk with Ari. She never thought anything of it, he was always just really nice and she was never weirded out. A year after Ari was working at this gas station, the man comes in and goes, congratulations on working here, working here for a year. Ari thought that was weird, because how did this man know the exact date that she started working there? And then the man started saying how his house is actually across the street from the gas station, and how his living room window faces the gas station, and how he has a chair perfectly aligned to see into the gas station. And then he started saying how whenever he sees Ari come into work, he gets really happy and he goes in to get coffee just to see her. So again, Ari was a bit creeped out by this, why is this man watching her from his window in his house? So the man then left, went back home or wherever he went, and Ari kept working, and it was a Sunday, so it got kind of quiet. And when it was quiet, the man came back into the store. Again, he started making small talk with her, and he was saying kind of the same things like, congratulations on being here for a year, you're an amazing worker, etc., etc. And she started feeling a bit uncomfortable at this point. So she told him that she was going to stock the shelves, so she was going in and out of the back room just to get stuff and stock the shelves. As she was doing that, at one point, when she goes towards the back room, the man starts going there with her. She thought he was going to the bathroom because the bathroom door was opposite from the back room door. But he didn't go into the bathroom. He went with her into the back room and he locked the door. So then Ari was like, I'm sorry, this is this area is only accessible for workers. You have to leave. And he was like, no, I came here for something specific. So either you come with me to my house or I get what I want right here. Ari is freaking out, but she's trying to act calm because... What else do you do in this situation? So she's holding these boxes. The man starts coming closer to her. He's saying how beautiful she is, how she's a really beautiful young lady and how amazing she is. And she's feeling incredibly uncomfortable and trapped because the door is locked and she's in there with him. And then she sees a box cutter on the desk where her colleague, I guess, had left a box cutter. So she decides that she's gonna go put the boxes down on the desk so she can grab the box cutter. So she goes and does that, grabs the box cutter and she tells the man to back off and he basically starts going towards her just when her colleague calls out for her because he had come to take over the next shift. The man then got freaked out, her colleague called the cops, and the cops arrested this guy. This guy ended up in jail for several other sexual assault cases and for statutory rape of a family member. That is Ari's story. So just to say, these things don't just happen in big cities, they happen in small cities as well. They happen everywhere. So a lot of people argue that you should never look through your man's phone. But like, what if you just have that gut feeling that something's going on? And even worse, what if you do open his Snapchat and see a naked girl? So I downloaded this app called Wink and made a friend that we can call Shane. And even though Shane and I got really close over the phone, he lived in another state. So we never really got to meet. But one night he was coming home drunk from a hotel with his cousin. And I was coming home from a college party. And I said his cousin, who we can call PJ, was hot AF. And so Shane was like, oh my God, let me give you this man's snap. And a few months later, PJ and I were talking, like talking, talking. 
and he agreed to drive the four hours to come to my state just to see me. I was busy cleaning my apartment that day preparing for him to come and told him just to walk in when he gets here. So when this man came in, I kid you not, he walked in with a bouquet of flowers and they were a dozen yellow roses, which he knew were my favorite. And after he left on Sunday, he asked if he could see me the next week and I happily said yes. And before long, PJ and I started dating, but this happiness was soon to end. So welcome back to me finding nudes on my boyfriend's phone. I'm sorry, ex-boyfriend now. But seriously, guys, do not be love blind because this guy literally was driving four hours to see me every week. He would call me on all of his breaks. All of my friends were completely won over by him. And it didn't take him long to win over my family, too. And about a month in, he finally took me to meet his friends and family. Our lives meshed so well that he asked me to move in with him at a party that night. I was hesitant at first, but then I packed up all of my stuff out of my apartment and moved out of state to be with this man. And after all of that, this man switched it up on me. He stopped taking me to parties with him and started leaving on Friday afternoons while I was at work and wouldn't tell me where he was. He wouldn't come home until like 6 or 7 in the morning on Saturday. And then we would just argue the rest of the weekend about it. Like, sir, I moved away from my family, moved out of my apartment, quit my job for you. He was straight up treating me like it didn't matter, and I saw him going to his phone all the time and acting secretive. And eventually I couldn't take it anymore, so I opened his phone when he was sleeping. So part three to me finding nudes on my cheating boyfriend's phone. I also forgot to mention this giant red flag. We were no longer active. Like this man had cut off our seg's life. So when I grabbed his phone, the first Snapchat that I opened was from a girl who was touching herself. My heart stopped for a second, but I was like, okay, okay, let me just give this man the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it's just some girl trying to be sneaky, trying to pull one over him. But then I noticed that all of the recent snaps were from girls. So I started to go through all of his conversations and realized that he was messing with every girl on his snap. Every! And then there was this one girl who didn't have like sexual messages with him. They were more like lovey-dovey. But it went back to way before we were dating, so this man had never been faithful to me. I broke down, I blocked every girl on his snap, and then I threw his phone at his face to wake him up. I demanded to know why he cheated on me, and that's when he realized that I'd blocked all the girls, and he freaked out and lunged at me. We got into an awe brawl, and I broke my hand in the process and locked myself in the guest room. I think this is part four to my boyfriend cheating on me with every single girl on his Snapchat. So this is, of course, where this man just, you know, sprinkled on a little bit of his, his gaslighting. I locked myself in the guest room, and then he started to cry and act pathetic from the other side of the door just saying that he was sorry that he effed up and he never meant to hurt me and it was all his fault and in that moment i didn't know what else to do i unlocked the door and cried in his arms terrified and i needed to go to the hospital because my hand was literally broken from our fight because i had given up everything and i was so in love with him i decided to work things out but it literally only lasted a week we made the decision to break up but he convinced me to keep living with him but we set up ground rules, which included no girls over at the apartment and him not talking bad behind my back. But of course, one night when we went out to a party, we got into a massive fight and he caused a scene. And he talked so much smack about me at this party that his friend, who's a girl, turned around and was like, hey, you need to come live with me. I packed up my things and left, but I ended up moving in with Shane, the cousin, instead. And then I got really drunk one night and slept with Shane, so like for the next part. My husband knows about my six-month-long affair, but he hasn't told me. Disclaimer, this is not my story. This is an anonymous submission. Okay, so let's start with a little background. My husband and I first met when I was right out of college in a new city. He swept me off my feet, and from that first date, it was magic. We married three years after that, and now we have an eight-year-old daughter. We both work pretty great jobs, and between caring for our daughter and work responsibility, we are both busy people. But he always made time for me and treated me like royalty even when I didn't do the same. Around the beginning of 2019, I became familiar with one of my coworkers, Nick. He's about my age, has a wife and three kids of his own. Nick and I started off so innocent. We would go out to work outings together. We would sit close by, but it all started when I sat on his lap. I guess he reminded me of when my husband and I were young. There was passion in Nick's eyes that drew me close to him. Eventually, we started sleeping together. I knew during the whole time that it was wrong, but I pushed through, never once thinking about the impact it would have on my husband. My morning started off as usual. My husband gets into the shower before me every day, and I snooze before I have to hop in too. He mentioned last night that he was going to stop by Costco on the way home from work today, so I grabbed his phone so that I could add a shopping list. When I went on the Notes app, it opened to a folder with dates listed on it. The dates started the first week of March and continued until last week. Part 2. My husband knows about my six-month-long affair. Disclaimer, this is not my story, this is an anonymous submission. I curiously opened one of the dates and to my shock it was a diary. 
I never knew my husband was the type of person to write out his thoughts or emotions. I read through the first couple entries of his diary and it broke my heart. The diary was all about my infidelity and how my husband was processing it. Looking at the dates that were listed, he discovered my affair about a month after it became physical. I hid his phone until he left for work, then I called off of work and read each diary entry. Almost each entry for the first three months after he discovered my affair were about how he planned on making me fall in love with him again. He detailed in his diary the plans he had to make me forget about Nick. He talked about taking us on a week-long vacation so I couldn't see him. How he bought my favorite flowers and cooked my favorite dish, but I continued to see Nick. As the time went on and I continued to tell lies to my husband, he would write in his diary how his resolve was beginning to waver. And now he was becoming depressed. He feels so lonely and unloved. After three months, the diary entries became wholly about his depression and how he cries every time he knows I'm with Nick. The diary entry from a month ago stopped me in my tracks. He wrote about how he put our daughter to bed. He was crying himself like usual, but the tears stopped flowing. He says that his body finally stopped producing tears for his failed marriage. He says this night was the night that the band-aid fully came off. And now that the band-aid was finally off, he felt a wave of relief, like he finally got over me. Two weeks ago, he decided to start an affair of his own. I'm so ashamed of myself and I don't know what to do. I never meant to hurt him.